Good evening, everybody. Pastor Mike, His Grace Church, right here in beautiful San Antonio, Texas, man, where we're touching lives and we're changing hearts. I want to welcome everybody here that's on campus, but especially a warm invitation and a welcome to those that are watching through our social media platforms right here, live streaming. And so you caught us for Amplify. Amplify is where we're turning up the heat every Thursday night with practical teaching for everyday living. We hear it, we see it in the Word of God, and then we live it together as a community of believers. And tonight, it's not going to be any different. So we're going to get right into the Word of God this evening, and uh, we're going to open with a word of prayer. So tonight's our midweek Bible study. We don't do any singing. We get right into the Word of God, and we study it together as a community of believers, and then um, we live it together as well. Hallelujah. Thank you. And so Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you right now, and we just thank you for this opportunity to look into your precious, holy, written word, for we know that the word of God is life and light and health and healing. We know it's power. We know it's truth. And so we thank you that you said in your word that your word would go forth. It would not come back void. It would go forth out of your mouth. It would not come back void, but it would accomplish that which it sent out to do and prosper in the thing where it's been sent. So tonight as we discuss, again, finances, Father God, we thank you that your word goes forth. We thank you for eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that are receptive to the word of God. We thank you for the anointing of God upon the word of God, and then the anointing also to, to, upon me to declare that word this evening. And so, Heavenly Father, we just honor you and worship you, and Father, just glorify you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, <clears throat> we're expecting great things from the Word of God this evening. And everybody said, <coughs> Amen. <clears throat> so tonight we're back into our study again uh, on Back to the Basics. So we're talking about the good life, and we're in the 16th uh, part of this particular um, series. And we're going to be talking about Navigating Wealth, a scriptural guide to money management. And we're going to be looking at uh, specifically uh, 1 Timothy. But, you know, in our last lesson that we had together, Pastor Mark was here last week, and so uh, previously before that, we explored, uh, you know, the delicate, delicate balance between wealth and spirituality, and sp specifically emphasizing um, Jesus' teachings from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 about the potential conflict that, we, that could arise when we, uh, between serving God and money. And so when we look at the delicate balance between wealth and spirituality, then we found out that the, this lesson clarified that having money then isn't inherently wrong, but it, it, allows, us, uh, it allows it to dominate our priorities but when, it, when we allow it to dominate our priorities, it can lead to moral and spiritual compromises. And so by examining various then real life scenarios within, this, within that lesson, we looked at Sam as a graphic designer who lost his passion for meaningful art in pursuit of, uh, of, of higher earnings. And what we found within that particular example was that the lesson underscored the risk of then letting financial success overshadow important values like family, integrity, uh, and spiritual growth. And additionally, we looked at positive examples then like if you remember Joe and Lisa, and we illustrated how through them money when managed in alignment with our ethical and spiritual values, we then can enhance our life, and we can also benefit others. And so within, within that particular lesson, then it, it just urged a reflective consideration of our priorities. And it helped us to understand that advocating for a balanced approach where financial success supports rather than detracts um, from our deeper commitments and values. So as we, as we progress in tonight, I'm going to take just a few moments and we're going to dive a little more deeply into examining whether money is truly the root of all evil. 
Is money truly the root of all evil? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation tonight. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Verse 11. But you, Timothy, are a man of God, so run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So let's go back to verse 10 again. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So what this verse does is it clarifies that it is not money itself that is deemed the root of all evil, but rather the love of money. Now from a, from a theological standpoint, this distinction is crucial. Why? Because it highlights a fundamental aspect of our Christian teaching on stewardship and the ethical use of our resources. So if we look at this phrase, the love of money, this refers to an excessive or disordered attachment to wealth. When we have this kind of attachment to wealth, it can lead us as individuals to pri prioritize financial gain above what we would consider moral, ethical, and even our spiritual values. And in our Christian belief, such as in such an attitude, then can lead to a variety of sins and harmful behaviors because it places money then at the center of our life. What, is, what we're doing is we're effectively idolizing it and displacing God and His righteous commands. We're putting money at the top above God. And the Apostle Paul, in his writings, warns that this misplaced love can lead individuals then away from their faith, resulting in a personal anguish and even spiritual decay. And so, Again, when we come back and look at this theologically, the focus then is on the intentions and the attitudes that accompany our financial pursuits. Because money as a neutral tool can be used for good or for ill. And it becomes problematic when it dominates our motivations and even our actions, thus leading to greed exploration or exploitation and the neglect of spiritual obligations. And so when we look at the scripture again in the 10th, uh, the 10th verse of 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6, this scripture again serves as a caution against allowing material success then to become the ultimate goal of our lives. And it also reminds us as believers that our primary allegiance should be to God, His Word, and His principles within His Word, which promote a life of generosity, integrity, and then love towards each other. So again, this scripture here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, identifies the love of money as the root of all kinds of evil. And this particular scripture remains relevant for us believers today, because it's emphasizing the need for vigilance in how we are to handle our finances and then pri prioritize our values as well. Because in, in modern society, where success is often measured by financial accumulation and material wealth, this biblical uh, teaching serves as a crucial uh, center point or counterpoint, reminding us then to, re, to maintain a balanced perspective on money. And a balanced perspective on money involves viewing and managing financial resources as tools 
rather than ultimate goals. And so when we look again at this perspective, it allows us as believers to harness our wealth in ways that enhance our lives and the lives of others without compromising our values or even our well-being. And I want to give you several what I, I, I would consider key components that define a balanced approach to money. Number one, we could say stewardship over ownership. So by recognizing that while one may control money, it ultimately belongs to a greater whole, be it society, be it your family, or in a religious sense, to God. And what this does, this viewpoint then encourages responsible management of financial resources by considering the broader impacts of our financial decisions. And the idea that money and all resources then ultimately belong to God and should be managed responsible, responsibly is well supported throughout the scriptures. So we're going to take, a, we're going to take a, a, a couple of scriptural references from the New Living Translation to back this particular statement. Because in Psalms chapter 24 and verse 1, the Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. So what this verse does is it underscores the concept that not just money, but all creation is owned by God. And then this ownership then implies that our stewardship of financial resources should reflect an awareness of our role then as caretakers of God's possessions because they're not just our own. And so, 1 Chron Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we could, that we could give anything to you? Everything we have comes from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. In this passage, King David is acknowledging during the offering of the temple construction, that all they have come from God. Everything they have comes from God. And what this perspective does is it encourages the responsible and humble management of resources, of our resources, recognizing that our ability to generate wealth is also a gift from God. Now, Psalms chapter 24 and verse 1 and 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 14 both promote a viewpoint that aligns with the idea of viewing money as part of a greater whole that is under God's ultimate ownership. These scriptures encourage us as believers to manage our financial resources wisely and ethically, considering not only our personal needs, but also the impact of our financial decisions on the broader community and in accordance with God's principles. So that's number one. Number two would be purpose-driven wealth. When we say purpose-driven wealth, what we're saying is money is seen as a means to support and fulfill personal, ethical, and spiritual objectives. This involves um, using financial resources to support causes and activities that then align with our values, and such as, you know, a charity, whether it be your church, whether it be a non another nonprofit, it's education, health care, <clears throat> and even environmental stewardship. And a scripture from the New Living Translation that supports the view of money as a means to fulfill your personal, ethical, and spiritual objectives, we can find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 where it reads, You must decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. 
So what this verse does is it emphasizes the intentional and value-driven use of money, particularly in the context of giving. And it encourages us as believers to use our financial resources then to support causes that, that we deeply value. And we're doing this not out of obligation, but with a joyful spirit. And when we look at this, this then aligns with using money to enhance the welfare of others through charity, as well as supporting education, possibly health care and envi environmental initiatives, then that reflect our beliefs, that reflect our ethical and spiritual commitments as well. And what we find in this particular verse is it highlights the principle that how we allocate our money can and should be a reflection of our deeper values and our priorities. So another key component that could define a balanced approach to money is avoiding excess. Hallelujah. A balanced perspective of money steers clear of the extremes of greed and extravagance. And what it does, it promotes living within our means and, here's a good one, saving for the future while also enjoying the present and enjoying it in a way that does not lead to wastefulness or indebtedness or going deeper into debt. And when we look at this, we can find support for the idea of maintaining a balanced perspective of money and avoiding greed and extravagance as we live responsibly for God in Proverbs chapter 38, verses 8 and 9. First, help me never tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, Who is the Lord? And if I am too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. So, what this passage does is it clearly reflects the wisdom of avoiding the extremes of wealth and poverty, advocating for a life that is lived within our means. But it also captures the essence of asking for, for just enough resources to live adequately without falling into the temptations that both poverty and wealth can bring. And, and, and the prayer to avoid too much or too little underscores the biblical value of moderation and contentment. Principles that then are found, that are, that are fundamental to living a balanced and ethical life that honors God. So another component would be financial wisdom. Financial wisdom includes educating yourself about finances, understanding the basics of budgeting, investing, and financial planning. And what this does, this knowledge then helps us um, in making informed decisions that can stabilize and secure our financial future and help against pitfalls of financial ignorance. And Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 3 tells us that a house is built by wisdom and become strong through good sense. We say common sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. Notice that, through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. So what this passage does is it highlights the value of wisdom and understanding and knowledge in building a stable and prosperous life. It, it metaphorically compares the construction and strengthening of a house to the wise management of your resources. <clears throat> and so, if you'll notice, the emphasis on good sense and knowledge then underscores the importance of being educated in financial matters, such as budgeting, investing, and planning, and this wisdom not only helps in building a secure financial foundation, but it also 
uh, helps in avoiding the pitfalls of ignorance that can lead to poor financial decisions as well. And we've all made poor financial decisions. Amen. But what, what this verse really does is it reinforces the idea that financial literacy is crucial for both personal stability and then the ability to accumulate and manage wealth effectively. So another component that could be defined as a balanced approach to money would be contentment. Being content where you're at. Finding satisfaction in what you have rather than constantly striving for more. And what this does, this helps reduce the stress associated with the pursuit of wealth and mitigates the risk of, of placing money at the center of our lives. So contentment then in modern terms can be defined as this. It can be defined as the state of satisfaction and acceptance where an individual feels fulfilled with what they currently have without an overwhelming desire for more or a focus on what they lack. That's a good analogy. Because many times when we're not content, we're focused on what we don't have instead of focusing on what we already have. And so, again, contentment brings a sense of gratitude and peace with our circumstances, appreciating the present without the constant restlessness for more. Hallelujah. And I tell you, when I was younger, I was always striving for the more. I was always striving to get what I didn't have. And I never really enjoyed where I was at. I wasn't enjoying the journey I was on because I was always working to get more than what I had so that I could maybe reach another echelon uh, of, of in life financially. And, 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 you know, there's an old story, the, um, the, the art of comparisonitis. We're always comparing ourselves to somebody else, but we're only comparing ourselves to what they have, not what they've gone to get what they've had, gone through to get what they have. So... Uh, consider so when we look at that then we, we walk with the knowledge and understanding that we need to be content where we are at in life now it's it's not going to be where you end up it's just enjoying what you have instead of always working to get what you don't have into what you have forgetting what you have has been brought for your enjoyment and pleasure as well you know let's look at a you know, I, I heard a story, and I'm going to use it as an example of Emma. Who, she's a middle school teacher, right? Emma earns a, a modest salary, and, but she manages her finances wisely and doesn't yearn for extravagant luxuries. She finds joy in her work, cherishing the impact she has on her students. And Emma then takes pleasure in simple everyday activities like reading books from the library, hiking in the nearby nature preserves, and spending weekends cooking meals with friends and family. And despite the allure of, uh, of a more lucrative career paths or the collective pressure from society to upgrade her lifestyle, Emma remains satisfied with her life as it is. Her contentment is not derived from material wealth, but from a deep sense of fulfillment in her relationships, her hobbies, and then her professional achievements. And because of that, this contentment then allows her to live a balanced, happy life, free from the stress of chasing unnecessary extravagances. And because of that, she has the ability to live more stress-free because she's content. And what we see in this example is how it illustrates contentment can stem from appreciation of life, life as it is, rather than continually striving for more possessions and achievements. You know, that's work. That's work uh, to continue striving and pushing for bigger and better. That takes work and energy. And so Emma Emma's example, then, what it does is showcases a modern understanding of contentment as a sustainable and healthy mindset that promotes overall well-being and happiness. Don't we want to be happy? I want to be happy. So, 
Number six, then, after contentment would be generosity. Now, generosity is a balanced view of money will include a strong sense uh, of, of generosity. If you have a balanced view of money, it includes a strong sense of generosity. Let me restate that. And so generosity could be sharing wealth with others, whether through formal charitable donations, or maybe in an informal support to friends and family. And what this does, it fosters a sense of community and, and mutual support. And so we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, because the Bible tells us in the sixth verse, sixth verse of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, remember this, a farmer who only plants a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Again, this verse uses the metaphor of farming, agriculture, to illustrate the principle of generosity. And what it does, it emphasizes that those who give bountifully will also reap bountifully, suggesting that sharing wealth with, our, with others not only benefits us as recipients, or it, balance, it not only benefits the recipients, but also us as the giver as well. And so what this principle does is it encourages us to act formally and informally through gifts of, through gifts of charity, highlighting the mutual benefits in, of generosity as we give. You know, it's always, it's, the old saying is, it's always more blessed to give. I like to give. I'm just not a great receiver. It's hard for me to be a receiver. But when we sow and we reap, we sow and we reap. As you sow, you are the giver. But there's going to be a harvest time where you are reaping. And so you're going to have to learn to, to be comfortable in the receptiveness. Or you have to learn to be comfortable in receiving as you are in giving or sowing. And so generosity then underscores the idea that a generous spirit <clears throat> contributes to building a stronger sense of community and mutual support aligning with a balanced and ethical approach to our financial resources as well. And then number seven is integrity or integrating money and ethics. Integrating money and ethics. And so making financial decisions that reflect our moral and ethical standards. This means that we are avoiding investments or business practices that harm others or are at odds with our own personal or spiritual beliefs. We're making decisions that reflect our moral and ethical standards. And this involves consciously then choosing where to allocate financial resources, ensuring that these choices do not conflict with our values. <clears throat> and what this does, this, practices, this practice is particularly relevant in what we would talk, call today's global, globally connected market where investments and business operations can have far-reaching social and environmental impacts. Let's look at John as an example. Not this John, but John who is a devout investor who, priorit who prioritizes ethical business practices aligned with his personal and spiritual beliefs. Now, John is particularly focused on social justice and ensuring fair label labor practices within the companies that he invests in. <coughs> As such, then when John is making investment decisions, he will then avoid companies known for poor labor practices or those that exploit workers in developing countries. And instead, what he chooses to do, he chooses to invest in companies that are transparent about the, their supply chains, that offer fair wages, and provide safe working conditions. And John also then extends this ethical security 
scrutiny to his own business operations. You see, John owns a chain of cafes and ensures that all employees are paid above minimum wage, they receive benefits, and work in a positive and safe environment. And what John also does is he often engages in community outreach programs that support the local employment and training initiatives that he believes in. And by aligning his financial decisions with his ethical standards, John then ensures that his investments and business practices not only yield financial returns, but also contribute positively to society or to social welfare. <coughs> to social welfare. And so what this approach then does, it not only affirms his co commitment to social justice, but also builds a reputation for ethical business practices not, that, that, that not only yield financial returns, but also contribute positively to his social welfare. Attracting, because of that, they begin to attract like-minded customers and employees to his ventures. Now, we've looked at seven key components that define a balanced approach to money. Imagine a family that practices this balanced perspective. They budget wisely, and because they do, they ensure they live comfortably, but not extravagantly. They save a portion of their income regularly and invest in, in a diversified portfolio that includes honorable funds. They donate regularly to charities and local com community projects. And they also make time for themselves by taking vacations and experiences that enrich their family bonds without leading to financial strain. And in their approach for money then, money is a tool for creating a fulfilling life, but not the measure of their success or happiness. And so what we see within this balanced perspective, it ensures that money then serves as a beneficial tool in life, supporting personal and community well-being without becoming a source of undue stress or ethical compromise. So now let's go back to verse 10 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, shall we? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Now, for believers, this scripture then serves as a warning against allowing wealth to become our central focus. It encourages stewardship, stewardship of financial resources, in a manner that aligns with our Christian values, such as generosity, humility, service to others. Because the love of money can detract from these values, leading to ethical compromises and diminished spiritual life. Let's consider, let's consider this example of a Christian business owner, Alex. Now, Alex runs a successful startup company in technology, and he, he's facing constant decisions about how to invest profits, expand the business, and then, on top of that, reward his employees for, for doing a good job. And living out of the teachings of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, Alex chooses to use his financial resources responsibly. He ensures fair wages for his employees. He reinvests in sustainable business practices and then donates a portion of his profits to charities that support education for the underprivileged children. But then he also sets aside time for his family and his church ensuring that his pursuit of business does not overshadow his spiritual and personal commitments. He doesn't let the pursuit of business success overshadow his personal 
and spiritual commitments. And in this way, then Alex is exemplifies how a believer can possess wealth without being possessed by it. He uses his financial success not as an end in itself, but, but as a means to support broader ethical and spiritual goals within his life. Now, what this does is allows his approach. His approach then prevents the love of money from taking root and leading to the evils of greed and self-centeredness, thereby aligning his actions with the scriptural admonition to prioritize godly values over material gain. When we look at this balanced approach, it's crucial then for us as believers that are navigating the complex financial landscapes of the modern world to understand that there has to be balance. There has to be balance in our life. That money can't be the center of our life. God is the center of our life. And money is a tool Amen. in our life Amen. that God uses to bless our life, Amen. to bless the lives of others, to bless his kingdom, to promote his gospel. Money is a tool. And so to have money is not a sin. To have the love of money, where money then becomes your God, your focal point, your center point, that is where we get into problems. But money in itself is not evil. Money in itself is just a tool to help us and to assist us in providing what God has already promised us. And so tonight we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. And what we found is this offers a profound scriptural guide on managing wealth that remains deeply relevant for, for us believers today. And um, what these verses do is they underscore that while money itself is not evil again, the love, and I use the word love of money, can lead to various forms of spiritual and moral decay. And we see that in the world all day long where people have sought after money and have lost and I use the word their soul. They've lost their direction. They've lost who they really are in pursuit. They've lost their family. They've lost their friends. They've lost their life all in pursuit of money. They've lost, they've lost their happiness. They've lost their stress-free life. Why? Because they are pursuing one thing, and that is money. Because if they have enough money, then their life will be good. Life doesn't revolve around your money. Life, money can make your life better, but it's not going to take the unhappiness, the divorces, the, the, the commitments that we, that we make. It's not going to shore these things up. We see that, we see that every day. People that are, are multi-billionaires, they're so happy with each other, they're getting divorced. Money is a tool. And so... That's why this verse underscores that while money itself is not evil, the love of money then can lead to various forms of spiritual and moral decay. And as such, they caution us to foster a, a, a balanced perspective on wealth. One that's going to prioritize spiritual growth and ethical integrity over material gain. And by adopting this lifestyle of contentment, generosity, and responsible stewardship, we as believers then are encouraged to use our financial resources as tools for positive influence, supporting personal, community, and spiritual objectives without succumbing to greed or selfishness. And this balanced approach then helps ensure that our financial decisions enhance rather than compromise our spiritual lives, reminding us in that true riches lie not in material wealth, but in our devotion to godly principles and the well-being of others. And through this lens, we see that managing money wisely is not just a financial strategy, but a fundamental aspect of living 
and fulfilling a righteous life. So in essence then, this scripture from 1 Timothy chapter 6 reinforces the notion that money in itself is neutral. It's neither inherently evil nor inherently good. It is the human heart's attachment to money and the intentions behind its use that determine its moral and ethical impact. See, money becomes a mere instrument reflecting the values and priorities of those who wield it. That's all it is. And when used with wisdom, generosity, and ethical considerations, money can be a powerful force for good, enabling acts of kindness, furthering social justice, and supporting communal well-being as well within our society. Conversely, though, when the love of money overshadows ethical principles and spiritual devotion, it becomes then the root of evil because it leads individuals away from their faith and into spiritual and moral dilemmas. Therefore, the condition of our heart, whether it is set on loving and trusting money or loving and trusting in God, then ultimately shapes how we enact or how we interact with and are influenced by the wealth that is bestowed upon us. And so this scriptural guidance within Timothy calls, for, calls us to examine our priorities and to align our financial conduct with our deepest spiritual commitments by doing so, it helps us to ensure that our actions with money serve not only our needs, but also the higher purpose of honoring and reflecting God's teaching in and through us. So again, money is just a tool. But Jesus tells us, Jesus tells us that where our treasure is, where our heart is. Where our treasure is, there will our heart also be. So, if you are focused on money, your heart is on money, and your heart is not on God. You can't serve both of them. You'll have to choose. But I tell you, if you choose God, we could say it like this. I don't like to say it like this, but money will follow. God will provide for your needs. And in, in today's society, money is one way to have our needs met. So if we put God first, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Money is not inherently evil, but serving money is where we get off base. Our heart changes. And when our heart changes away from God, and unto another God called money. That's where this scripture comes in, for the love. You have turned your love from your father to your money. And when that happens, that's where this scripture says, for the love of money. Let me read it to you in closing. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. When money becomes your God, it will open up a storehouse of evil. And it says, some people craving money have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Hallelujah. Serve God. Serve His kingdom. And these things will follow. But money is not evil. It is a tool and a resource that God uses in your life. Where we get into trouble, once again, is where we make money our God. We're pursuing money. I know people who, who were in church. Man, they came to church. They were diligent to to give their tithes and to be part of the family of God. And then, you know, they got to looking for bigger jobs, better payouts. And as they pursued some of this, 
not everyone, but some of these individuals end up getting their dream job, took them out of church, quit giving. They were pursuing stuff, better life for their family. But it cost them because they left their faith. They relinquished their beliefs of God and trusting in God to be their source and began to look at money as their resource to get what they needed. People have left churches, have left jobs, have left cities, all in pursuit of money and a better life. And in the end, I've watched some of these people, not all of them, end up in the spiritual junk heap. And because they got out, out, out from under that protection, they're not only in the spiritual junk heap, but they're financially ruined as well. Don't pursue after anything but God. And God will lift you up and honor you. So the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's just a tool. What you do with it is up to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that the word of God has gone forth. Father, there, if there be any within the sound of my voice tonight that has never accepted Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to work alongside of me, help me to convict them of their unrighteousness, their need to know Jesus. Father, your word says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life that no man can come to know you except through Jesus. Now, I know everybody here on campus, and because I do know you, I know that your salvation is secured, but you may be watching through any one of our social media platforms tonight, tomorrow, or whenever this is broadcasting into your home. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I just quoted John 14 and verse 16 where the Bible says, Jesus makes a statement. He's the only way to the Father. The only way. No one can come to the Father except through Him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if we'll open, declare, we'll confess that Jesus is our Lord and believe it in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, then we would be saved. That word saved is just a Greek word that means to be made whole. That without Jesus, we're incomplete. But when Jesus comes into our life, we are made whole. There's a spiritual principle that occurs. We are translated. It reminds me of Star, Star Trek when they used to beam them from one planet to another. We are translated from, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. That old man who we are, which we are a triune being, spirit, soul, and body, there's a new man that comes to live on the inside of you that is alive unto God. To be dead means to be separated from life, cessation from life. And when we accept Jesus in our heart, we now become part of the family of life. God is the father and author of life. And we go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life and light. How do we do that? We just simply pray a simple prayer. And if you've never prayed this prayer, then I encourage you to pray this with me tonight. Join me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and become Lord of my life. I boldly declare that you are now my Lord and that God raised you from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm born again, I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm a new creation in Christ. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, let me be the first to welcome you into the kingdom of God. Something miraculous and wonderful is happening to you right now. You may not understand it, but it is Jesus coming in to your life. It may be an emotional experience, it may not be. But I encourage you to do two things. First, check out our website at www.hgcchurch.com under forward slash resources, and there is a short video series there called The New Birth that Pastor Kim and I put together. 
and it's just about 10 videos, five to seven minutes long in each video. It's very short. Just gives you an executive level synopsis of what's happening to you to give you some understanding and knowledge. Second thing I encourage you to do is find yourself a good Bible-believing church. If you're in the <clears throat> San Antonio area, man, His Grace Church, we believe, is such a place as that. We're a small and uh, a smaller community of believers where everyone can know your name. Not only are we a church, but we are a family. And, you know, a family that hangs out together, we get together, we do social events together, something that you can be a part of that's bigger than just maybe yourself. And so come check us out. We're located in the far west part of San Antonio. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a map on our website at www.hgc.church forward slash locations. We're uh, out here by Kalani Harley Davidson inside Loop 410, just off of Claybor Road and Alamo Downs Parkway. Very easy to find. Our service times are 7 p.m. Thursday for Amplify, and then we have our Sunday morning worship celebration where we kick up the jams. We have the worship team. We sing, we praise, we honor God, and we connect with God through music as well as the teaching of the Word. And that begins 10:30 every Sunday morning right here on campus, or you can also join us because we live stream through any one of our social media platforms. So, man, um, other than that, we will see you right back here Sunday morning for our Sunday morning worship celebration. Um, if you haven't already, let me just give a plug to our social media platforms. I know if you're watching, you're on one of them, but you can also find us on Facebook, X, through our YouTube channel and Rumble. And if you haven't followed, subscribed, or liked on any of them, please do so and give a heads up to your friends and pals as well to encourage them to come check us out. So I'm Pastor Michael Pillmore. This is His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation where miracles are still happening today. And I want you to know that Pastor Kim and I believe that God has something unique to say to you this week. And our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. God bless you. I'll see you right back here Sunday morning, 1030 a.m.